Hello and welcome to The Farming Week, the podcast from Argoland that keeps you up to date with all the latest in Irish agriculture. I'm Charles O'Donnell and I'm joined today by journalist Ashling O'Brien and Agriland beef specialist Brefney O'Brien. We start this week with the issue of water quality, which was on everyone's lips late last year following confirmation that Ireland's nitrates derogation would be reduced to 220 kilograms of organic nitrogen per hectare. This week, Chagas hosted its water quality conference, at which it emerged that local authorities are hiring additional staff with a view to increasing the number of farm inspections that are carried out in relation to water quality. Ashling, how many more inspections are we looking at here? Yes, Charles. So I suppose when farm inspections are mentioned, it piques the interest of farmers, but even more so when we're talking about increasing the number of them. So the issue of farm inspections was discussed at the conference by Ray Cullinan, and he's a senior manager with the Environmental Protection Agency's Office of Environmental Sustainability. Now, as you mentioned, he said that more staff are currently being hired by local authorities around the country in order to ramp up the number of inspections on farms related to to the GAP regulations, of course, that is the good agricultural practice for protection of water regulations. Now, he said that there were just under a thousand local authority farm inspections carried out during 2022. And the target that's been set down in the third river basin management plan means that this will have to increase to some four and a half thousand inspections by the end of next year, the end of 2025. So that obviously is going to take additional resources. He said that when the EPA analysed the 2022 data for the 31 local authorities, they got a figure back of roughly 10 full-time equivalent persons throughout the entire country who were dedicated to agricultural inspections, which of course is a very low number given the, the size of the country and the amount of farms that are out there as well to inspect. Now, Cullinan said that 21 additional staff are currently being recruited by local authorities around the country, with more expected to follow. And I suppose listeners might be wondering, Charles, what the EPA's role in all of this is as we're talking about local authorities. Well, under the latest Nitrates Action Programme, there was an enhanced enforcement role assigned to the EPA in relation to the oversight of local authority farm inspections. And that included developing, implementing and overseeing a national agricultural Inspections Programme, or NIAP, for local authorities. Now, two of the EPA's national enforcement priorities for local authorities this year relate to reducing the impact of agricultural activities um, on, on water quality when it comes to farmyards and from farmlands as well. And the EPA is going to have to answer to the EU Commission on this as well. They're going to have to provide them with data every year on how many inspections were carried out and what, if any, any enforcement proceedings were taken and what the result of those were as well. So the conference was told that the inspection locations will predominantly focus on water bodies where agriculture has been deemed to be a significant pressure is how it was described. The EPA is going to supply local authorities with a list of water bodies that are impacted by agriculture and also the measures needed to improve water quality along with mapping tools. And also uh, Ray Cullinan told us that local authorities may actually use complaints or planning inspections as an opportunity to uh, undertake an inspection um, for these gap regulations as well where it's appropriate. And Ashling, did the conference hear anything about the current levels of compliance or otherwise on the in terms of the current inspection regime, how how thing how the figures are looking there? Yes, Charles. So the 2022 data is what is available to us at the moment. We don't have data for last year yet. So the conference was told that in 30% of the inspections carried out in 2022, non-compliances were detected, which required follow-up inspections. Now, interestingly, Ray Cullinan said that feedback that they've received in the EPA from farmers who are essentially doing the right thing on the ground when it comes to water quality, um, they want to know what the consequences are for those who aren't. And he said that there is a demand out there amongst the farming community to see a more consistent approach around adherence to regulations. And here is what he had to say when it came to the importance of standards around inspections. The aim really from the, the, the NAIT programme is to, to increase that number of inspection, you know, to, to carry out more inspections. And, you know, it's the only way you can detect non-compliance is if you carry out the inspections. And it's not just about numbers either, I'd, I'd like to add, because it's significant about um, the quality of those inspections. You know, the boots on the ground, you have to get out and meet, meet, walk the farm, talk to the farmers, 
see what the pot issues are there, uh, check and follow up on non-compliances that happen on the farm and go back a second time. So that, that's, that's part and partial of the programme that we're rolling out with the local authorities um, in terms of the follow-up uh, inspections particularly are really, really important. So Ray Cullinan there from the EPA, Charles, uh, talking about the importance of um, standards when it comes to inspections on farms uh, around water quality. And look, there is plenty more from the conference um, on Agriland from that Chagask Water Quality Conference, um, including a warning from a senior researcher in Chagask that a return to the stocking rate of uh, 250 uh, in areas that have dropped to 220 under the nitrates derogation is unlikely. Uh, that is the warning from Dr. David Wall, and he said he believes that there may be additional parts of the country uh, where farmers will also have to adhere to the reduced minimum stocking rate of 220. He pointed specifically to the River Slaney in Wexford and the River Blackwater in County Cork as well. So a lot of uh, interesting content from the, the conference, Charles, and people can check it out on Agriland. And I'm sure, Ashling, that uh, farmers will want to keep an eye on that because even though we all recognise that uh, farm inspections are absolutely necessary, but they can be ver- very stressful for farmers at times. Absolutely. Moving on now to news of a potential new suckler cow scheme, which appears to be on the cards. Agriland beef specialist Brefney O'Brien is here to tell us more. Brefney, do we have a time on, timeline yet on when this scheme might be rolled out? Yes, yeah, so we've seen there, Charles, that the new suckler scheme, it's expected to be rolled out in July. So this is going to be a reformed suckler scheme. And uh, it is currently expected that there'll be no upper limit on the number of weanlings per herd that will be eligible for payment. So this scheme is going to be f- approximately fifty euro per weanling, and uh, it's it still is in the negotiation stage and is yet to be giving a title. But it will be the scheme that will replace the national beef welfare scheme. So as you said, Brefney, this scheme is um, slated to replace the current NBWS scheme. So with that in mind, can we venture a guess as what kind of measures uh, are going to be involved in the scheme? Yes, yeah, so obviously suckler farmers will be familiar with the National Beef Welfare Scheme. It was rolled out last year. It had an upper limit of 40 calves. Um, and I suppose testing for the presence of IBR in herds was one of, I suppose, the more contentious measures in the previous scheme. However, it's uh, at present it, it looks as though this uh, this will be scrapped um, in the in the new scheme when it is is rolled out in July of this year. So I suppose some of the measures that will be in it, I suppose the meal feeding one uh, was fairly popular. Um, so it's uh, envisaged that a payment of thirty five euro per eligible calf will be will be under the meal feeding measure and maybe an additional fifteen euro. Uh, will be available for a vaccination measure of of some sort. Um, so, as well as the fifty euro per weaning payment, um, it's currently being considered that an optional add on of four hundred euro a herd will be will be offered to assist suckler farmers in developing developing herd health plans. But obviously, before the details of this new scheme is fully finalised, it will have to be pr- approved by the Department of Public Expenditure and Reform. And obviously, we'll keep be keeping farmers up to date on on the details as they are approved and come available. Thanks very much for that, Brefney. And just to kind of move away from schemes, but to, just to stick on the issue of farm payments just for a moment, uh, Tierlan has said that uh, under its 2023 trading bonus scheme, €6 million Euro will be paid to around 4,700 of its farmer shareholders um, as part of that scheme with uh, milk suppliers, grain suppliers and dry stock shareholders as well, all potentially being in line for uh, for payouts under the trading bonus. Moving on now to some significant political developments in the agri-sector in the last week. The Stormont Assembly and Northern Ireland Executive returned this week after two years, with Andrew Murr of the Alliance Party being appointed as the North's new Minister for Agriculture, Environment and, and Rural Affairs. And on a wider basis, I suppose, in the EU, uh, after farmer protests in several countries in recent weeks, particularly France and Germany, I think it might be fair to say, Ashling, that they haven't gone unnoticed by the European Commission. Definitely not, Charles. I don't think they could ignore the fires outside the European Parliament recently when over a thousand tractors descended on Brussels. And especially, I suppose, the European elections are looming in June. They're coming ever closer. And farmer protests are continuing as we're recording in Europe. And, you know, given the scenes in Brussels as well, the politicians, they can't ignore what's happening out there and the anger that is, you know, being expressed by farmers right across Europe. Of course, we had thousands of farmers came out here in Ireland as a show of solidarity with their European counterparts as well. 
So last week we got the news that the Commission was bringing forward a proposal in relation to fallow lands under cap. So a relaxation of that regulation is being proposed by the Commission. I suppose that was maybe the first olive branch uh, to the, the protesting farmers. And then this week, the president of the European Commission, Ursula von der Leyen, said that she has going to propose a withdrawal of the Sustainable Use of Pesticides Regulation, or SUR. Now, that regulation was proposed by the Commission in June uh, 2022, and it aims to reduce the use of chemical pesticides across Europe by 50 percent by 2030. Now, speaking at a plenary session of the European Parliament uh, on Tuesday, Ursula von der Leyen said she would propose to the College of Commissioners to withdraw the proposal. She said it had become a symbol of polarisation and she added that the proposal was rejected by the European Parliament and there had been no progress on it in the EU Council. So it was pretty divisive. But she did say that the, the overall topic of pesticide use does stay Um on the agenda and that the Commission could make a new proposal with much matured content um, and with the stakeholders coming together on that as well. And look, understandably, there's been uh, a lot of divided uh, reaction to the divisive proposal as well and the withdrawal of it. Um, The International Federation of Organic Movements, IFOAM, um, they have said that it's with regret that they learned about the withdrawal of this proposal. They said politicians who claim that they defend farm by refusing to reduce synthetic pesticides fool themselves and the public. And also we had reaction from the group representing EU farmers and agri-co-ops, that's Copa Kajega, and they said that there was a lack of dialogue and the imposition of objectives from above and the refusal to assess the impact and the lack of funding for agricultural proposals must end now. And uh, they obviously welcomed withdrawal of SUR as well. And look, you know, we have a lot more going on in Europe as well this week. We had emissions targets as well and uh, the, the reference to agriculture and uh, methane was also removed there. So it seems that there is some sort of a softening or perhaps maybe even concessions being made to the agricultural lobby. And uh, you have to say that the, the elections in June have to be playing a role in that, Charles. I would certainly imagine so, Ashling, yeah. And you mentioned there um, the president of the commission, Ursula von der Leyen, and she says something else that was interesting recently as well, uh, where she signalled out the issue of administrative burden or the red tape that farmers deal with as something that should be uh, should be addressed. Has uh, President von der Leyen outlined any, I suppose, concrete measures to address that yet? Concrete, no, but I suppose farmers will be interested to see any efforts to reduce, as you said, red tape bureaucracy, sitting at the kitchen table with reams of paper and, you know, they just want to go out and farm. They just want things to be simplified out there. And often schemes and diktats from Europe can be tied up in in red tape. And Ursula von der Leyen said she acknowledged the concerns from farmers on regulatory requirements that they deal with. And she said it was something that she wanted to address. Have a listen to some of what she had to say. And I'm very sensitive to the message that farmers are concerned by administrative burden. This is a general topic. You know that this is close to my heart to reduce these administrative burdens. So we will work with the Belgian presidency on a proposal that we then will present um, ready in time before the next Agricultural Council to work on reducing these administrative burdens. So as you heard there, Charles, this proposal will be developed in time for the next meeting of agricultural ministers. That is due to happen at the end of this month. Um, And look, you know, it's interesting to note as well that she did make reference to the trade agreements. Obviously, the EU Mercosur trade deal is a highly, highly controversial trade deal. And uh, look, it's interesting that she she's taking into account the concerns of farmers and the demands for a level playing field when it comes to free trade agreements. So hopefully that is something that uh, the top brass in Europe will take on board in future. Mm -hmm. It will be very interesting, Ashley, to see how these developments pan out in the next three to four months because it's hard to imagine that the the protesting farmers uh, around Europe are, are done protesting just yet. But moving on from politics now, and Ashling, you attended a, an important meeting this week in relation to deer management. What did you learn? Yeah, so this meeting was chaired by the IFA's Forestry Committee Chair Jason Fleming in the Drum Hall Hotel in Killarney in Kerry this week. Charles, now Teddy Cashman, he's the chair of the Irish Deer Management Strategy Group. He was invited to speak to farmers about the work of the group 
on an issue that's very pressing, not just in Kerry, but right across the country, particularly in Wicklow, I'd say, of course, that is the impact of deer and the explosion of the deer population in recent years and uh, how we're going to tackle that. So in December, the the group uh, chaired by Teddy Cashman published a report containing 15 actions to tackle deer, eight of which are recommended for early implementation. Now, Cashman told the meeting that a program manager is expected to be appointed in the coming months and work is then going to get underway on establishing 10 deer management units and they'll be put into hotspots around the country over the next 12 months. There could be two of them in Kerry, six of them in Wicklow where there's a particular issue and then two or three others in other parts of the country and there'll be coordinators put in place to bring these new units across the country together and Teddy Cashman stressed the need for collaboration and for people to get together on a local level. And uh, he did say that there'd have to be consistency of approach here as well, that this is an issue that will be on an annual basis going forward. This isn't something that a group is going to just come together one year and it's all going to be sorted out. And look, you know, there is a big issue around culling as well. Uh, Around 87% of the 1,500 respondents to a survey carried out by the group called for a national deer cull. And Teddy Cashman told me that the government is currently working on changes to the open season for hunting deer. Have a listen. It's all about collaboration and getting people together to organise in a a local area, get appropriate hunters, um, set targets that need to be achieved and to get the work done. But um, initially what's going to happen is the appointment of a programme manager to to put the, get the process running and to get coordinators in place. There are also legislative changes that are happening at the moment and there are statutory instruments and extensions to the, the seasons for, for shooting deer are hopefully coming into place this year. So that's Teddy Cashman there, the chair of the Irish Deer Management Strategy Group, um, telling me that there is a good possibility that there, the two different seasons for male and female deer will be extended this year. Interesting to note as well, he said that the European Union is currently considering classifying Sika deer as an invasive species. And if that happened, those deer could actually be hunted every day of the year. They wouldn't need particular seasons. Now, the, the group is also working to streamline the process for the granting of Section 4 42 licenses from the National Parks and Wildlife Service. Those licenses allow for the hunting of deer out of season. And uh, we were told that the NPWS has allocated extra staff to that area and that should be addressed this year. And negotiations also underway with Quilcha and the NPWS about the increasing of culling of deer on state lands as well. And Ashling, uh, Teddy Cashman also said something else that struck me, which was he called for government support to um, establish or to set up a viable wild venison market in Ireland as a potential point of destination for culled deer. How close is that to actually being realised at the moment, would you say? Well, it seems to be one of the biggest issues exercising his mind, Charles, from what he told the meeting. He said the creation of a sustainable wild venison market, it's one of the biggest issues that needs to be addressed and it may need to be subsidised by the government initially. There's only a handful of people dealing with venison at the moment. And if we are getting increased culling numbers out there, as we expect to see in these hotspots, uh, Charles, uh, over the the coming years, you know, we're going to have to do something with the, the carcasses and... And um, the meeting heard that we will need enhanced infrastructure um, for venison, for the carcasses, you know, storage larders will have to be put up around the country and, uh, you know, hunters as well. Um, the limits that are currently placed on hunters, they're only allowed to, um, I suppose, directly sell to hospitality sector, maybe only a handful of carcasses. Uh, I think three was the number that he said, and they're working now to, to get that removed. I think hunters over in the UK, we were told, can uh, pitch as many is 3,000 uh, carcasses uh, if they want. Um, so obviously there's a big discrepancy there as well. But yeah, a lot of work to be done on the venison side. And uh, Teddy Cashman said it's something that he really is trying to work very, very hard on because, you know, we want something, uh, an outlet for these carcasses if, if we're going to be carrying out this culling as well. And speaking of out- outdoor activities, Ashling, although uh, this one is slightly uh, less controversial, a Galway woman living in Dublin has found a way to combine her love of outdoor activity with something uh, entirely different. 
Yeah, so this is Karina Duffy. She's a fitness and wellness coach and uh, she has a business called Eco Fitness uh, that is based in Dublin. But uh, she just had a bad experience, I think, with dating apps, Charles. Many people out there who are single might be, you know, so frustrated with swiping left or right or, or whatever the choices may be. And she just wanted to, I suppose, organize events that were in person that seemed more genuine to her, at least. So it began uh, in June 2023 in Dublin. There was their very first walk. There was awful weather, but uh, a lot of people showed up to that. So they're called Single and Mingle events and uh, they've been taking place uh, right across the country here in Kerry and in other areas as well and uh, it's I suppose to acknowledge the, the beauty of, of the, the countryside around us but also to allow people to you know just to, to relax in a kind of you know a less pressurised environment and uh, she said that farmers are, are walking the walk as well here Charles because farmers have been turning up in numbers to these single and mingle events as well and she said that you know it's giving farmers the chance to to chat to maybe up to 25 women at a time, you know, and look, farmers are often outdoors, but they're often alone as well. And, uh, you know, these are lovely social events. And uh, it's been a story that's been really, really popular. And look, Valentine's Day is just around the corner as well, Charles. So people might want to be thinking about a significant other if they don't have one. And uh, as you said, it, it might not be as controversial <laughs> as uh, deer culling. But, uh, you know, look, it, it's something that's worth keeping in mind, given the time of year as well. Let's play cute. <laughs> well, finding love in rural areas is one thing, Ashling. Finding a place to live uh, can be quite another. But Very if anyone uh, listening um, has the former sorted out and is thinking about the latter, uh, you might be interested to hear that new guidance was launched just this week uh, to support energy upgrades in older, traditional or historical buildings. So maybe that's something to keep in mind if uh, anyone has an eye on a place in the country. But unfortunately, that's all we have time for this week. Please don't forget to rate, review and follow The Farming Week on Spotify, Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. We'd love if you could spare some time to give us five stars and share The Farming Week with anyone you think might be interested. From myself, Ashling, and Brethany, have a great weekend.